Hi everyone and um, welcome to today's webinar, Personal Branding. My name is Monica Monti and I'm a member of the IOSH Logistics and Retail Committee. We have around 4,000 IOSH members from the warehousing, logistics and retail industry and our group is growing steadily. Over the next 12 months, we will be hosting many more webinars and um, our health and safety conference in October. So I do hope to see you there. Um, our guest um, speakers today will be Rhys Cherry, uh, Director of Health, Safety, Quality and Environment at Yodon, and Mike Roebuck, Consultant at Shirley Parsons. The webinar will give you an insight into the world of personal branding from an employer's perspective. So I do hope you'll find it useful. Now, let me hand you over to Reese and Mike. Over to you guys. Thanks, Monica. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is um, doing well. I hope you're doing well as well, Reese. I am. Thank you, Mike. Yep, not so bad. Thank Very you. Good. Good, good. I'm, uh, let me get up the. Um, right, so just um, uh, this webinar is on um, personal branding. Um, just, um, I guess, to, uh, I guess a lot of people think with personal branding, it's all about um, LinkedIn. But for me, it goes uh, well beyond that. Um, so we've, this is how we kind of breaking down today's session. Um, so it's going to be start, starting with um, how to create a great CV. Um, and I myself am a recruiter, so I see a lot of CVs. In fact, I spend all day looking at CVs and talking to safety professionals. We'll then go on to how to um, interview well, how to build a good internal brand as well. not something perhaps that people think about a lot. Um, then uh, how to build a good external brand. Um, and then we'll have a discussion at the end about how to get um, more young people interested in health and safety. So uh, that is the, uh, the plan for today. Um, so who, who, uh, who, who are you uh, speaking with today? So. Uh, we've got Reese Cherry, um, who, um, so firstly, you've got a step onto the, uh, into safety back in 2009. Um, and over those past 12 years, um, you're now, you've built up a career where you're now um, leading health and safety, environment and quality uh, for one of the largest um, parcel delivery companies in the UK with a team of um, nine direct reports. Um, so we'll be um, talking about some of your um, your story there, and you've got an interesting quote as well. So could you tell us a bit about that? If you have if you have to fight a dragon, go to its lair before it comes to your village. Yeah. Uh, so you know, some people who uh, follow Professor Jordan Peterson might be familiar with that quotation, but uh, for me, it's uh, maybe a reflection or a meditation on um, you know going and getting things done. So there's lots of things in this world that we put off and we. We don't like to have those difficult conversations or, you know, I've got to go to the dentist. Maybe I don't want to do that. But, you know, ultimately, yeah. I, I use that quote. It helps shape my thinking around, look, go and get things done before they become a problem for you. OK, very good. Very good. Um, and then uh, just a bit about myself. I think a lot of people here would have um, uh, heard of Shirley Parsons previously. But we're a, we're a, um, a global uh, network of HCQ um, talent. Um, I myself um, am responsible for any um, HCQ hires in retail and logistics, hence why I'm linked to the IOSH Logistics and Retail Committee. Um, I don't have a, a live quote myself, actually, uh, but maybe um, by the end of this webinar, I'll, um, I'll have one, hopefully. Um, right, so um, first things first. So let's um, pick apart how to write a, a great CV. So I guess, firstly, be more like Sean Bean, maybe. Um, so first question um, to you, Rhys, I suppose. Um, so you you have a team of um, of nine at the moment. Um, so if when, when you're receiving a CV, what kind of um, attracts you and doesn't attract you, um, would you say? Yeah, OK. So, you know, caveat up front is, I, is I'm definitely not a CV expert, but um, as Mike alludes to, yeah, I'm, in, I'm in a recruitment campaign at the moment. So, you know, I see uh, a lot of CVs coming through. 
Um, for me, a CV is a lot like a smile. It's almost your first opportunity for me to, uh, yeah, I think, to make a good impression. I liken it yeah. to if you go on the first date. If you don't make a good impression, you're probably not going to get invited back for a second. So um, the goal is, I think ultimately the goal is, you know, to get in front of your prospective new employer. And for me, the CV yeah. is almost that first step in the process of being able to yeah. have that really important conversation. So, you know, what do I like? So ultimately, I, I think, you know, it's not a great long list, but uh, simple, clear CV. So so no dodgy fonts or overly crafted templates. I think, you know, sometimes they get doctored before yeah. they get it as well. So just easy. I'm a simple person, so easy, simple to, to read CVs. Simple bullet yeah. points I think, at the top quarter of the page, really highlighting, I would say, the relevant experience for the role at the start of the CV. So don't be afraid yeah. to tailor it for the role that you're applying for. It's always it's always good if I can see quite quickly um, how your skills and experience would relate to the role that I'm recruiting for. And then yeah. I, I guess lastly for me on that one, Mike, would probably be around tangible and very specific examples of uh, personal deliverable. So. Um, you know, yeah. I've delivered the project which has led to that impact. I think it's a really important one for me. Okay, yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. So, just to to add to that, and based on um, my experience of receiving lots of CVs and also um, talking to lots and lots of um, health and safety hirers out there, um, the main thing to focus on um, when you're a couple of things really. Um, firstly you want to bring out your achievements because everyone knows in a health and safety role, you're going to knows you're capable of doing kind of toolbox talks, um, risk assessments and all that stuff. So you want to focus on what you've achieved uh, and what the result was from that. Um, and then also you want to provide some, um, some context to those achievements. So the size of company, what the company does. Um, and the second point really is it must, must be easy to read. If you think people uh, are receiving these CVs, are potentially receiving a lot, um, it must must be easy to read and aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I'll show you a great example of that coming up. So here we go. This is um, how we would uh, recommend um, laying out a good CV. So you, and again, if you, um, if anyone would like to see this after the webinar, just email me and I can send that through to you. Um, so you can see there's. Um, a clear kind of section where you can um, <clears throat> list, your, list your achievements and then it's a context to those achievements and it's easy to read. So it's easy on the eye and it's not uh, difficult to read. So that's the, they're the two main points there. Um, and there is, an in, there is a section for hobbies and interests. Uh, we would always recommend um, including these because you never know, um, you might have some uh, common ground um, with the interviewer potentially there, as long as they're not too uh, obscure. Um, again, just, I guess, a bit of um, self-awareness there needed. Um, okay, I think that's... Mike of something very obscure. Uh, yeah, there see. was actually. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, a guy, the strangest one is, um, a guy said, breeding Welsh ponies. All right. Cool. I mean, if, if it's uh, if it's what you're into, it's what you're into. So, um, um, <laughs> but, you know, um, so that is the, I think that's the most obscure, obscure one. That I've uh, I've come across in the in the past I would say. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I can't yeah I can't think of any others, but um, I'll come back to you. Um, so the next section. So hopefully, so you're never going to get a job um, just from um, a CV alone. Uh, the next step um, in the process, obviously the the interview. Um, so first uh, question for you, Reese. Um, I guess, so throughout your career, you would have interviewed firstly for officer roles um, and now uh, kind of your, your interviewing for director level roles. How has it kind of uh, changed over the years, do you say, if it, in any way? Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point, really. I think it has changed. Uh, I think it's changed yeah. quite significantly, to be honest. I think um, as I progress through my career, and I've, I've probably had kind of more senior interviews, um, I would suggest yeah. that they become less technical the more kind of senior the roles have been. Um, I yeah. think, you know, to coin a phrase, you know, you've earned your stripes, uh, you know, potentially. So so some of the things that maybe in my earlier career that I would have shared, you know, I tend to be asked less about nowadays. Um, and it tends yeah. to be more about you know, how a person or how I 
can integrate well with the organization. So I think, you know, if you're an alien in terms of fitting in with the culture of the business, yeah, your effectiveness can be hugely compromised. So I think simply being able to get things done matters. And I think yeah. it matters to, to the people that are, are interviewing. Um, I think probably the second point I'd mention is around uh, longer, kind of more in-depth competency-based interviews. And when I say competency-based interview, I'm, I'm not talking about technical skills. I'm talking about, yeah. you know, as we refer to them sometimes like soft skills. So, um, you know, for me, I think about my most sort of recent interviews, uh, competency-based interviews, I think, was really about helping my new boss better understand how I would handle situations and, and positively impact in the environment I might be working in. And I think, you know, my boss needed to know that he could leave me in a world of probably unknowns. You know, we're in a pandemic. There's lots going on. Volumes are, yeah. um, you know, massive at the moment. Um, lots of variable situations. And I think the outcome from that interview was that he needed to be sure that, you know, the metaphorical fires have been put out. You know, people yeah. are healthy and safe and, and, you know, the business is, yeah, basically dropping parcels at people's doors and and you know he's not left with lots of problems if that makes sense so that's probably yeah. the, the big change for me okay fine all right um so okay um and then uh second question for you if you were to not to go to um here's morgan on you i suppose but um if you were to oh. give some give some advice to your younger self um interviewing all those years ago for the for the more junior roles what would you uh what would you tell a young Reese? Would you say? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think I'd probably start off with some positive reinforcement. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's right to really prepare for the interview. I think I used to question myself: Am I, am I over prepping? But you know, I'd probably tell myself to think, think hard about easy to understand examples uh, of, of where I've added, um, yeah. you know, positive impact. And, and examples that I could probably share with somebody who wasn't maybe as operationally health and safety familiar as I was. So, you know, think about who are companies, companies, uh, you know, your perspective new boss is often an HR person in an interview. Um, yeah. you know, and that's also somebody that you need to connect with. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Work hard, yeah, so work hard to really connect with all the people in the room. Um, yeah. Also, the effort to meet people where you can. I think, you know, conscious we're in a, a, you know, in a pandemic right now, but we won't always be. And I think, you know, I've had some opportunities to to do interviews via the phone or in person. And I think back to my yeah. craft time opportunity. Um, you know, I think I left home at about four a.m. to travel to Wigan um, to be, you know, my my then new boss. Um, yeah. Just now a face to face conversation, and probably about two years later, over a pint, we laughed about that, and he said. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got an impression about you, you know, and, and how you would probably operate immediately from that decision where I said, no, no, I'll come and meet you. And, he, you know, he knew that I had to travel sort of several hours. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, putting that little bit of legwork in up front, you know, is absolutely the right thing to do. But in terms of learnings, I would say yeah. um, I'll probably tell myself to be more open uh, about sharing right. my personal aspirations um, yeah. And probably be too apologetic about, you know, where where I'd want to be in my career. I think, you know, I was I was quite worried. I think I was quite nervous about being perceived, you know, maybe negatively, maybe sort of, you know, who does this kid think he is? You know, where is he going? He hasn't got the experience yet. Um, yeah. And I was probably a little bit reserved. And that probably could have made me appear limited in my shelf life for a company. So... Okay. You know, I think that's that's certainly a call out that I would make. And then lastly, I would say around um, relaxing, you know, be human, uh, be yourself. And I think when you yep. do that, you, you quickly find some common ground with interviewers um, and you can have more of a what I refer to as a conversational style approach, as opposed to feeling like you're on a game show, you know, answering questions for prizes, which isn't my preference in style. I prefer that conversation, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I suppose to to build on that, um, when uh, just uh, shared some some uh, content here, um, to build on that, yeah, when client when our clients uh, like our candidates, it's usually when they can um, can get on with them well. Um, when I take you're right, when I take briefing calls from clients, it's usually uh, sometimes they want people to hit the ground running in a particular industry, so they might want someone with kind of warehousing experience um, and and hit the ground running. Um, in that environment 
more often than not, it's um, it's the character fit that is the most um, kind of the most important. A, a lot of the time, clients are saying to me, "Oh, Mike, I really, I, I just want someone that we want to go out to the pub with because we want to, not because we have to." Um, yeah. So you want the people just want someone that they can get on with. So there's definitely, like you say, um, finding common ground with everyone you're interviewing with. So it, and um, adapting your style to kind of a HR person, managing director, or a health and safety professional. Um, the fourth point on that list um, about um, dynamism and being dynamic, um, that is, if I think about um, like the health and safety marketplace at the moment, that is being dynamic is really what is setting people apart, I would say, um, and particularly um, for the for the senior level roles, a lot of the time uh, when I talk with clients, they say, I just want someone that's going to bring something interesting to the business, something a little bit different. Um, so that's, I think, for for listeners here today, that's something something to um, definitely to bear in mind, I would say. So it's the it's like the, the dynamic approach, really. Um, uh, so it's not people aren't looking for like the health and safety policeman uh, really anymore, I would say. Um, so that's that's the um, the main point I would make there. Um, mm. And then, so if we move on um, to this little guy, um, look at him, he's just just trying to do a good job. Um, so I, in, if I talk about internal brand, it's kind of any business you work in, um, if it's health, whether it's health and safety or could be anything, there'll be a um, a persona that people um, have of you internally. So it's important that you kind of take steps to build a good persona. Um, so from your talking from experience, what are some of the best ways you think to impress uh, and build a good reputation for yourself internally once you've got the job? Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, to coin a phrase from Richard Branson, I, I always used to like this one. It used to say, um, he used to say, uh, if you're offered an opportunity, say yes, and then figure out how you do it later. Um, yep. and, and look, I don't mean, you know, just take anything on. Clearly, you know, we have competencies. You know, I wouldn't uh, put my hand up to lead a nuclear power plant, you know, a safety team within a nuclear power plant. But, uh, you know, often we are asked to lead things which may not strictly be safety related. And I think, if I think back at uh, my time, um, you know, packaging recovery notes, uh, PRNs, yeah. some, some people in the food industry that are really familiar with those, um, you know, not anything to do with health and safety. Um, you know, so yeah. there's a lot about compliance and tax, but, you know, someone in the organization needs to manage these things. So rather than pass it around when it presented to myself, I said, OK, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on, even if it's only for a period of time. Um, yeah, I think what it does, it demonstrates to people that you're willing to contribute, you know, perhaps to a greater mission as opposed to just the things that that interest you. Um, and yeah. in my current role, you know, I, I've recently said yes to leading the the training pillar for regulatory and legislative elements. So they're going to come in under the HSEQ umbrella. Uh, and yeah, you know, the reality of it is, you know, have I led a training pillar before uh, for 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 a business? No, I've, I've, I've certainly contributed to it. I've certainly helped shape it. But really, I think it was led by the HR teams or the L&D groups you know, in a former life. Um, but you know what? That's OK, because I'm going to bring in some you know, quality people. Um, I have somebody who will be joining my team very, very soon uh, who has the right passion to drive this forward. Uh, within my team, yeah. I've got some fantastic experience of uh, people that have worked in the training department or, or owned that in the past. So they know what worked well and what didn't work so well. And you know yeah. what? There's a really good network of people out there, Mike, that, you know, I know that if I just drop them some notes and say, look, yeah, I'm really needing a bit of a hand or, or a bit of a guidance or some steer on this. There's a lot of people out there that, that I'm pretty comfortable, confident would, would, would help me with that. So I think that's, yeah. that, that would be one element. And then I think probably also get to know people outside of your function and collaborate cross-functionally. So there's a massive yeah. world out there. Uh, we've got procurement, we've got quality, we've got marketing, and all of those people, you know, equally in, in, similar to health and safety, touch different parts of the business. You know, a procurement person or a procurement team 
you know, they'll, they'll, they'll work for everything from raw ingredients coming in, um, you know, yeah. all the way to the packaging, uh, you know, whatever it goes in, so to speak. So I think if you can understand those teams, uh, understand what challenges they have, you know, it's really yeah. common to find that, um, you know, there's these problems that have been hanging around for a while. And if you can get in and help fix issues, or at least simply get hold of it, provide a bit of a steer or a way forward. I think people really appreciate that. And it starts to really build on your um, your yeah. brand, like person or as a team. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of a, it's like a, it sounds like a win friends and influence. Yeah. Like a, like approach because it, yeah, I think um, a lot of uh, when I speak to a lot of uh, health and safety people out there in the marketplace, they say that it's a struggle to sometimes get buy-in, particularly from uh, from senior management. So that can help if you kind of make an effort to uh, build a, a positive persona internally um, in order to kind of uh, win it, win influence. Um, and have you ever um, got into a business? Um, and there's been a perception that, like, I guess health and safety is a little bit, a little bit boring, um, and people are a bit unengaged with it. And how do you, and if so, how do you kind of tackle that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I, I have, um, you know, it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Yeah, we're, we're passionate about what we do, but I think other people sometimes outside of our function, you know, don't necessarily understand what we do. So, um, yeah, so I think you have to work at those relationships and accept that, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not responsible for what happened before to give people those past impressions, but I can certainly take responsibility for the here and now um, and yeah. contribute to changing that perception. You know, I genuinely don't think that, you know, what we do is boring. Um, so, you know, I, I feel that that's a challenge that I could take on. Um, yeah. But I do think <clears throat> ways to influence that, you know, the quality of yours and your team's interactions, they matter. Um, and I think the question yeah. I ask myself is from those interactions, uh, you know, are they adding value or are they bureaucratic back covering type exercises, right? And, and every company, regardless of how big or small it is, will have a past and there'll be, um, I guess, wounds uh, and those kinds of things that, you know, which which affect people's behaviors, right? You know. Um, yeah. But from from my perspective, you know, I always kind of consider from those interactions that we have, let's reflect on them. Um, you know, how, what's the impact on the health and safety brand? Uh, and are we helping or are we hurting the perception of health and safety? And a lot of that's about, you know, behaviours. So yeah. I think it's important to make effort to work with people, understand, you know, what they've yeah. been asked to do routinely. So, you know, I think on a week to week basis we'll have lots of asks to people outside of our immediate network and you know maybe they have to do checklists and audits and that kind of thing and they don't see the value you have to remember that can probably be the only integration point with safety that they have so it's yeah. good to understand yeah what is it that you're asking them to do is it boring because it because it might be um and do health and safety with them not to them you know yeah. that's it i can't remember where i heard that uh some years ago i think mean, perhaps even might have been one of my old bosses but you know, it was something that stuck with me for a long time. You know, am I doing health and safety to you or are you part of this journey? Are you on the bus? Are you contributing? Yeah. And then I think, you know, kind of lastly, Mike, and, and this is probably not for, for everybody, but I think when appropriate, um, you know, I will share a little bit about myself personally with people that, you know, that I trust. So, yeah, my HR business yeah. partner, for example, will be someone who, who, who I'm close to, will know, uh, about me he'll know that you know i like a good bourbon i like cars i like live live music i like comedy and i think through having yeah. those personal conversations and uh, with people we show that we're not gray suits and clipboards um yes. and i think yeah, yeah. for me that that's really important I'm, i you know i love what i do i'm really passionate yeah. about what i do i wish everybody else was but the reality of it is they're not so i think you've got to show your personality in what you do yes yeah i think that's that's a great point so i guess it's like if you if you are open yourself and you demonstrate openness, then you're going to get openness in return, I suppose, from uh, the people that you interact with. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, my experience, yeah. Yeah, um, and I guess, so just to, yeah, to kind of build on that, I guess it's um, uh, win, winning, friend, winning friends and influencing people, networking internally, getting to know as many people as you can, possibly, um, and then you want to get to the point where 
um, operators are kind of calling you and saying, oh, hey, Reese, um, I need to do this, but can you advise me on how to do it safely? So that you need to, so it's good to yeah. get some, and I think it, them understanding you and understanding your personality helps with that. Yeah, and, and, and I think ultimately, Mike, I'd rather people call me or my team and ask for help than, you know, kind of do things on the quiet or, or you know, yes. which might yeah. be right. I think if you can get to that point where, you know, look, we, we know the business needs to operate. We know what needs to happen. Um, you know, I need to do this task, but how do I do it safely? Or I need some support in doing it safely. I think it's a great conversation yeah. to have rather than turn yeah. up Monday morning and find out that it's happened anyway, but but not yeah. in the way that you yeah to happen and someone's been injured yeah okay yeah very yeah so I, I guess you need to be open in the way you communicate and you need to have also a good presence within the business as well and I, that yeah. comes from um yeah that internal networking so uh okay very good um so uh the next um point that we're going to discuss on this um personal branding journey for everyone um so external branding um so for me it really um, I guess come, two points come to mind. Um, there's it, it, a personal brand is really like the the power and extent of your personal network, I would say. Uh, and the second point is really, I think that comes back to like what you give back to the community that you represent. Um, so can you share with us any examples of um, how you've built your network previously and uh, what that's led to? Uh, yeah, um, so I got involved with um, IOSH, so East Anglia branch, um, you know, a fantastic group of people there that um, were running that, and also the Forklift Truck Association, and that really came after some encouragement from you know, a previous leader of mine uh, and a mentor, uh, Neil Catton, so he was quite open about, look, go and get involved um, and, and contribute. So I think, yeah, yeah, from memory, I nervously presented at two forklift truck association conferences. Um, I can't remember how many years ago now, uh, but the presentation yeah. seemed to really hit the mark, you know, reviewing feedback. And I think what that led to was uh, a group of people, my peers reaching out to me afterwards. And, you know, interestingly, they share their challenges and you often realise that you have similar challenges but you know some of their their challenges or some of your challenges have already been overcome so they fix theirs yeah. and that, that for more advice well actually you can learn from them and they can learn from you so um you can al almost help each other and i think that goes a long way so yeah. presenting and, and being involved and in, in, in attending uh you know it helped me grow my network tremendously and, and as i said to you earlier i think you know i know that there are people out there that i could reach out to for their advice experience and support to to help me in my mission here at Yodel, um, yeah. you know, as I have done in the past. And I think, you know, a good example is I, I recall meeting uh, a gentleman called Graham Andrews, who was the Heineken's warehouse manager. Um, yeah. You know, interestingly, he, uh, he, I met him at the FLTA conference and um, he was very passionate about forklift truck safety. Uh, and, yeah. you know, he was sharing some of the work that Heineken had done um around really uh, what they refer to as almost the forklift truck experience so i took my operations yeah. team with me there to visit their site and then they visited ours uh and we learned a yeah. great deal and i think that yeah the, the the forklift truck experience from memory was uh it was about helping people in you know heineken's world uh their forklift yeah. truck drivers care about their forklift trucks almost as much as the cfo did about spending money repairing stuff every week um, yeah, uh, you know, and, and they just kind of happened to, to really develop a nice program uh, with yeah. some massive safety benefits. And to be honest, we they're all transferable nuggets of gold is probably how I'd, I'd describe yeah. it. And we took that back into our uh, business, uh, all these little yeah. tools and techniques and made it work for us. Um, so, yeah, that, that was fantastic. And, and Graham's perhaps, you know, still something that I, you know, I reach out to every, yeah. every so often. I've, I believe he's left Heineken since. But, uh, yeah, really, yeah. really good at opening those opportunities. And then I think that's, lastly, yeah. go on, Mike. Got no, go on. So I was going to say, so that's quite a good example of um, you, you turn up to speak somewhere, not knowing what you're going to get out of it. And you just kind of, you do it just to like, to say yes um, and give it a go. But then you through that it's opened up opportunities and it's kind of enabled you to have more success in your role at the time through um through building your network 
Yeah, hundred no. percent. I think you know, I'd I'd be first to admit that I don't necessarily have all the best ideas in the world, but you know, certainly um, I can recognise you know really good transferable um, you know ways of working that that that's going to drive our business forward. And you know, I was able to share with uh, Graham and, and his team a number of pieces of work that we've been working on that they took back into to their operation. So I think it was a win win really. And then yeah. I, I think. Something else, uh, which yeah, you know, I'll probably live and die by this. And I think entering you know your, your businesses into safety awards um, is yeah, it's simple to do, but often we we don't do it. So okay, yeah, yeah. there's a reluctance to do that for whatever reason it is. But um, yeah, I see safety award entries as as a tool in our toolbox to really develop you know that engagement with operations uh, and okay. yeah, really, I guess promote the good work that the team and the operations are doing and i think yeah. over, the, over the years uh, yeah we, we've entered a number of awards and my teams uh i've got first second third place and, and you know what it doesn't really matter where they've where they've got to in those awards what what it's led to each time is the ops teams wanting to do more uh yeah, yeah. they're generating ideas they're pushing the safety agenda you know that they're, they're writing uh and generating the safety capexes so certainly yeah, you know, I'd encourage anybody to, you know, get involved. Yeah, you know, what's the worst yeah. that can happen? Get your teams behind you and enter into those safety awards. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It must um yeah, motivate people internally and also kind of improve the brand of the the actual business you're working for as well. And then you'll be seen as um responsible for that as well. Um in in um in in entering the company into those awards. So yeah, very good idea. Um and um, could you share with us also, I think people would be interested to understand how you originally got a foot into the door in safety um, all those years ago? Yeah, yeah I can. It, um, it was it was a bit of a fluke, to be honest, but it was the best decision that, that I ever made. So so I didn't fall into it. Uh, it was a conscious decision. Um, and, yeah. and I did it all over again. I absolutely love, love it. But um, effectively... You know, I left school uh, and I went to college to study a national BTEC diploma in software development. And it seemed like the yeah. right thing for me to do at the time. Quickly de- you know, learned that it, it wasn't the right thing for me to, uh, in, you know, probably about a year after I started it. But um, during the six weeks holidays, I guess, leaving school and then going to college, um, I, I worked in a factory, in a local factory, doing all kinds of things, um, you know, whether it was grading, uh, fresh produce, whether it was making boxes, you know, whatever it was, I was doing all kinds of things. And uh, I eventually I went to college um, and as I was uh, about to leave and go to college, I was offered a quality assurance uh, role. So I did that for, for a part yeah. time. Uh, eventually uh, dropped out of college, decided it wasn't for me. And I went to pursue a career as a gas engineer. So self-employed gas engineer, um, put in services to uh, buildings, giving them gas supplies, basically. Um, yeah, and I was really following in my brother's footsteps, you know, um, probably wasn't aware of what I could really do, um, you know, so yeah. kind of more acutely aware of what other people was doing. So I thought, OK, that might be something that I'd pursue. Um, long story short, I hurt my back repeatedly. Um, you know, yeah. I was probably not educated as, as I'd want to be in manual handling. Uh, you know, I was visiting an osteopath, um, young and full of energy. And I was going to the osteopath and he was saying, yeah, Reese, you, you've really got to stop this, you know, because you're, you're constantly injuring yourself. And um, I eventually gave myself a, a, a bulge um, towards the lower of my uh, lower of my back. And effectively, it meant that um, I couldn't bend or move. So yeah. I remember thinking at the time, um, you know, I, I need to do something else. So I went back uh, to a uh, back to that factory part time. And the reason I went back to the factory part time was because uh, my old boss or the old general manager there said to me some years later, some years before, you know, if you ever uh, want a job, um, give us a call. And he sort of yeah. took me down down this uh, story about how people had previously left uh, that factory had thrown, uh, you know, things through windows or just not behave really well on the last day. And he said, yeah, you haven't done that. So if you ever want a job, come back. And I remember thinking at the time, thinking, no, I, I'll never be back here. You know, this is not for me. Yeah. Well, you know, that old expression about never burn a bridge uh, because I gave yeah. him a call and told him my story. 
said, look, you know, uh, I need to go and study something else, but I also need some part time work. Um, and so he took me back in. And I think within about three weeks, I was driving a forklift truck, uh, put me on, yeah. on some track. I was driving a forklift truck, running big grading lines. And at that point, I then went and studied uh, a NEBOSH uh, general certificate. Now, yeah. why did I do that? Well, I'm not entirely convinced that I knew that that was the right route for me. But I do remember thinking to myself, look, if I could have a positive impact in somebody else's life and they don't injure themselves, maybe yeah, re educate someone a little bit better than I was in terms of things like manual handling. Maybe that would be a good thing. Um, I remember talking to my brother and my dad about it you know, at the time. And, you yeah. know, and I remember well, if they had a, quite a lot of apprehension, but um, they said, you know, if that's what you want to do, go for it. And, and really, that's that. You know, all these years later, yeah. um, that's kind of where we are. So it's... it's yeah, so the um, I guess the main lesson is to yeah to maintain those or build those relationships for whatever you do by performing well in your job at the time and then uh, maintain those relationships because uh, you never know uh, when you might need them uh, further down the line. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'd, uh, I'd probably add one, the bridges, last thing, uh, I'd add one yeah, last thing, Mike, and that would be you know take the opportunity when you can. I think the safety yeah. manager who was at that factory, uh, you know, was unwell, um, went off with, with, I think it was swine flu at the time. Um, and I was asked if I'd help the safety team out, you know, write some risk assessments and write some safe working procedures, that type of thing. I said, yes, uh, you know, that, that uh, safety manager yeah. that was there didn't come back. Um, so that gave me my opportunity to start my first role as a health and safety uh officer for that factory so yeah that's that's almost how that's almost my story of how i got into it okay very very good very good um so to i guess to sum up um like i was saying um at the start of this slide um uh, and also you kind of you uh, alluded to as well it's kind of uh just getting stuck in basically i think uh so getting stuck in volunteering to uh speak at these networking events attending a lot of these networking events um even if you don't quite know how you're going to perform just just go for it and like there will always be something that comes from it even if it's not kind of an immediate win it could be for you it could be further down the line um and i put there kind of um getting your face out there as well um so that can be um and i'll allude to this on the next slide but it's can be kind of getting your face out there on LinkedIn, um, attending networking events, um, speaking at networking events, running webinars like this, um, getting to know us well at Shirley Partners as well can can help um, quite a lot. Um, and I know what a lot of people could be thinking that um, oh, it's not really me, kind of, I just want to get on with my job and do a good job and that's it. Um, but if you kind of get your face out there um, and become known, um, then it more then that equals more opportunities, uh, both in terms of career prospects and in terms of potential success in the role you're currently in. Like like you said, meeting that guy, having off the back of speaking at an event, meant that you had you've got people there that you can call on if you've got a problem in your current role. So you could I don't know some people could be entering uh, a company where there's an enforcement notice that's particularly niche and they've it helps that you can then kind of call on somebody um, that is that you have in your network. So it's all about, I would say, just build your network, 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 network. I'll say network one more time and that's it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, so going on to the next slide, this is just um, an example of just some stuff that I um, share on LinkedIn. So you see the one on the left um, is uh, it's actually um, ground up chicken carcasses behind me, believe it or not. Um, so that's smell? me on it. Unbelievably, it's kind of, uh, it smell, it's like, kind of feels like it lives on you for a couple of days. Um, but um, so that's, that was, I should have put that in the post as well. Um, <laughs> but the point, the point I want to make here is that um, I've shared one, a picture of me um, in front of a pile of rubbish. Um, and that's got, four of that's got four or five times the amount of engagement compared to the um the slide on the right which is kind of an interesting industry article but it's less kind of um 
I would say like entertaining if you like um so it's more I think pe it's more engaging if you can yeah get your face out there like I say um and add a bit of kind of personality to your uh, presence in the marketplace um because you're never going to build a personal brand um if people don't know who you are um so that's just I thought a point worth making there and again people might might feel a bit shy about doing that but I think the, the benefits um of doing this stuff uh is uh, I've made, made clear. Um, so I think that's um, so the next point we're going on to is about kind of I guess getting young people into health and safety because there's I guess a lot of people out there there probably be I mean there's a lot of bright like teenagers and people in their early twenties that um, <laughs> they just don't have any idea what they want to do. Um, how can we kind of um, inspire young people to get into health and safety? more you think it's it's a, it's a really interesting question because i think it's a challenge that you know uh will impact you know our sector our industry you know years from now um i think i was probably one of those uh young people who didn't really know what i could do in fact i think i, yeah. I remember even somewhat confused i remember taking a profiling test at school when i was finished i think my careers advisor said reese you can be anything you wanted um yeah but suggested you consider being a milkman or a vicar um and, yeah. and you know i decided not to go with any of those um but you know i i didn't really know about health and safety uh and that it could be a career move I, I didn't know that it could be something that's taken me you know to multiple different countries multiple different regions um and i've had a real whale over time to be fair so uh, i'm really grateful for that i think there's lots of value uh, in us as professionals taking, you know, what we are passionate about to to those people. You know, whether that be at colleges, at schools, at career days, I think, you know, that's a, a really good way of giving back. Uh, and it's something which I'm also very yeah. interested to, to do in my local area as well. Um, yeah. And I think the opportunity to attract the right people for the future, signpost them, you know, maybe to events such as Irish Future Leaders programmes, you know, and there's others. Yeah. Um, to, to sort of show them, look, this is what we do and this is what we're about. I certainly yeah. don't have that knowledge when I come into it. There's also there's also um, people that have a lot of qualities um, that could be uh, good for health and safety as well, isn't there? I mean, it, people that, for example, are good public speakers or perhaps people that are good with um, numbers and analysts as well. They they mm. um, might enjoy and get satisfaction out of a career in health and safety. Um, there's, about, there could, there's something to be said for maybe uh, talent spotting. For Absolutely, it could be could be an option, but I think a lot of people just don't know about it. It seems um, as a as a career option. Yeah, and there's lots of roles, Mike. Let's let's be honest. There's lots of roles in safety: uh, data analysts, yeah. administrative roles. What about you know kind of engineering? So technical specialist roles, project yeah. managers, auditors, training roles. You know, it's not just a holistic health and safety person type role, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose if if um if that was to ever be arranged, uh, getting people to talk, getting health and safety people to talk in colleges and schools, it really needs to be the the right inspiring health and safety people, doesn't it? To to get get out there and uh, uh, yeah, I think I think that seems like a good idea to uh, mm. to get into um, colleges and schools. Um. So I think that's yeah. So that's just to, to summarise um, what we've uh, what we've said there, um, and I think that brings us to the end of the uh, webinar. So the next is questions and answers. If we've got any that have come through, and I'll just uh, yes uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Reese and um, Mike, some really good. Yeah, no problem. Um, the key for me were um, kind of things like passion, be yourself, just go out there and do your bit and be in the public domain yeah. to, to increase your chances. Um, I'm now going to yeah. hand it over to my colleague Lee Bennett, who's going to take the questions from the um, from the audience, and we'll wrap up yeah. the session. Lovely okay. meeting you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Monica. Um, Mike Reese, excellent session. Really, really good. Um, 
I didn't have a quote prepared and, and I noticed that you two have got quotes at the beginning. So one that came to mind, which is a favorite one of mine, uh, is from Alan Sugar and it was on The Apprentice. On paper, you look good, but so does fish and chips. <laughs> yeah. How, how might someone inject some personality into a CV? You know, we, we've, many of us have got years and years of experience and lots of qualifications and things. How, how can you tailor your CV to, to sort of get the attention of the hiring manager? Um, I suppose that that'd be, should be me that takes, takes that one. Um, it kind of uh, goes back to the, I guess the being easy to read is the is the key. Um, and if you, um, I think what a lot of people lack sometimes is a good description of the company that they've worked for. Um, and I think it's about uh, summarizing those achievements and what that's, if you can talk about those achievements and what it's, um, what that has meant to the company and what the company has uh, gone on to do as a, uh, as a result of your achievements, that is, um, I think, quite powerful. Um, yeah, I think if you um, can sum up those at the, at the beginning as well of the, of the CV, that's, um, that's, yeah, that's so quite important. Maybe I'll just contribute to that, uh, Lynn. Yeah, if I just contribute to that. So, so you know, when I see CVs come through, there's, there's, you know, often we put a short description about ourselves at the very beginning um, and, you know, to inject some energy and, and maybe just sort of reflect who you are. Um, you know, does that first couple of lines talk about compliance and that you're a, a technical specialist or does it talk about, you know, your passion and the things that you care about and why you do what you do? And I think, yeah, you know, when you kind of read them, you've probably got about 30 seconds to a minute to make a really good impact. Yeah, you know, when you've got a stack of CVs on your desk. So um, I think that's a really good way of, of, of differentiating yourself from probably the other people on the market. OK, um, Jimmy Quinn put in the chat about the star technique. Do you, do you think that would be uh, relevant to go into a CV? The star, the, well, the, the star technique would be more for um, more for interviews. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that is. I kind of touched on that really anyway with the that cv layout that uh, i've got kind of uh, covers that because it's got if you if you look at it it's got uh, firstly a context to what you're doing then it's got your responsibilities so that's the um the state the company was in um the projects worked on that's like that's your actions and then uh, the achievements are your results so i think that's the star methodology is really good, um, and that's I think that's very well known uh, amongst a lot of people, and that's useful uh, for interviews. And then I think the um, yeah, if you put yeah, if you if you put your CV as uh, as the template I've shared, then I think that 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 would cover the star methodology. Yeah. 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 Um... There's a couple of questions came in about your CV, um, the, the one that you shared. Marital status and nationality and driving license, are, are those are those relevant? Uh, dri yeah, driving license. We, I mean, we would we would check that anyway. Um, you don't really you don't really need marital status. No, um, that's okay. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, yeah, which is quite quite broad um someone put in the chat about um they've gained cm iosh status so they're a chartered member of iosh yeah but then when they're looking to apply for roles they're being dismissed because they don't have experience in that particular sector so yeah so that's um that someone's a specialist in in uh, logistics and retail and then they apply for a, a a role in manufacturing but they don't get put forward because they don't have experience in manufacturing. Yeah, um, I, I can cover that. Maurice, you might, might have something to add as well. Um, it's quite a common problem and also something we, uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with clients, we try to steer them away from just, just looking at sector experience. Um, so if you, I mean, if you're going through us, it helps to know us well. Um, if we, if we know you well and we know kind of your ins and outs and and, and all of that and we can articulate to your uh, to our client why you why you'd be a good match for them so if you if you know us well then that that can help 
uh, quite a lot. If you're just um, thinking about the CV coming through to the client that's not coming through us, um, it can help if you're um, if it's exceptionally well laid out and exceptionally articulate. But also if you're doing um, some things that are just wider health and safety community, um, that that helps as well. So if you're part of an Irish uh, branch meeting group, or if you're doing something for the Irish future leaders, for example, if you're yeah, speaking speaking there, or you're a, a, an instrumental part of a branch meeting, so something that's like things that are like that are broad, um, that that can help your case as well. I would say. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's it's uh, probably it's, also worth relating things things that are that you've done in your current role that could be relatable to the to the role that you're applying for. Yes, good point. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. Just a couple of things to add on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think um, in, in my early days, particularly um, some of the, the the businesses that I interviewed for or even worked for probably didn't really understand uh, about IOSH, didn't understand the importance of CPD. Um, and that's probably a reflection on the hiring managers looking to get some somebody in a role, in a seat as quickly as possible. So, it, yeah, I think it doesn't automatically get you through the door. What, what I would say is... Um, I'm, I have been interviewing people, as in last week, the week before, that are not necessarily uh, parcel industry, um, you know, experienced. And for me, what's helped me is to see what their experience is and understand how that translates into or how it transfers into what I'm looking for. Um, goes back to really what I was saying. You know, you get to a certain point maybe in your in your roles uh, and your experience where it's less about just the industry it's more about how you know can you have that right impact if i bring you in this business tomorrow will you have the right impact to drive things forward in the way that you know we need you to um and then i think just lastly on that i think as hiring managers and there will be hiring managers on this call um i would say um don't just look inside your own your own industry i would say that certainly um and and somebody's just given me an opportunity to come and join the odal team the parcel industry and I've spent the last 10 plus years in food and drink, um, you know, industry. So, you know, certainly skills are transferable. Uh, and certainly we we should uh, go broader than, than just feeling comfortable about people who know what we know. Yeah, I suppose the difficulty for, for hiring organisations is is they tend to just want, want what they've, they've always had. So if... Yeah. if, yeah. Um, if, if if Fred used to look after health and safety, we just want another Fred, which can be quite frustrating for, for people who who chartered IOSH and, and even grad IOSH, but don't have that sector yeah. specific experience. Um, I, I suppose the phrase I would use is is hire the attitude and train the skill. You know, it's we could always yeah, we can always, yeah good point. The, the, there are very good very good people out there that might not be you know might not have the experience in that particular sector. I think there's uh, potentially um, some education needed of, for some companies to be more uh, like ambitious with wh where they want to take health and safety, um, and yeah. and we we would always try and do that in terms of like yeah, open to trying something different. And I think so that I think there's some encouragement to um, like company leaders should be done there. Yeah, so. that's one. Well. Yeah. Um, a question about tracking software, CV tracking software. Um, right. How often is it used in the shortlisting process and what should I include to get selected? Are you aware of any tracking? Oh, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't it's know. This is like the Mike. So thinking about, you know, I think I was told years ago that, you know, make sure there's certain buzzwords because when you upload it onto, uh, you know, job websites, etc. Yeah, we all, the algorithms will put it through. How true that is, I have no idea. But um, uh, I guess yes, yeah. No, that is true. I mean, it's it it can yeah, it can help to. Uh, there are like if you think of jo just generalist uh, job boards out there, then that can can help um, to be uh, yeah to include more. Um, yeah, it can help to include more buzzwords in your in your CV. I suppose, I suppose it goes back to what we were saying earlier about tailoring the CV to the to the uh, 
the job that's been advertised. And, and, you know, I could sense the frustration in the question that someone's changed their CV hundreds of times to, to, to get a job or to get an interview. And it, it can be frustrating. So I guess, I guess as, as, yeah. as someone shortlisted people before myself, I've got a copy of the job description to one side and I'm looking at the CV to see if they hit the requirements of the job description. So if it's a generic job description, it's perhaps not going to get shortlisted, whereas one that's tailored it to this job is saying, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, which is related to the job that I'm uh, interviewing for. So I, I, I guess it's just tailor the CV, as frustrating as it is, uh, tailor the CV to the job. Yeah. A question for Rhys, um, how can you interact with people in your business without coming across like a headless chicken? Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's a fly in the room attacking me. Uh, I would say uh, pick your opportunities. Um, so, you know, I can, I can remember having some of the best conversations over uh, the coffee machine or, or in the kitchen making a coffee with with somebody in commercial um as i did in any formal meeting you know um and i think you know looking for those opportunities to go and engage with people um and look i'm human just like everybody else there's some people in this world perhaps you'd you'd, you'd rather engage less with um but i think you need to seek out that audience and identify you know who is it that can help you know your safety mission and who you may be able to contribute to their mission because it's you know the overall goal is the organizational goal right so um you know having lunch with people you know i you know i've had lunch with commercial teams um i've had lunch with marketing teams uh spent some time with procurement teams and and what that's really given me is an insight as to what their challenges are and what they understand to health and safety to be so a commercial team that i used to work with was was quite open in saying i see health and safety is just like a bit of a roadblock to be honest what we want to do is put the pallet like you know twice as high and scram more into the the back of the wagon why can't we um and so you know that conversation kind of went from right yeah what's the benefit of doing that well we save thousands of pounds a year and commercially it makes the right you know the right business case but yeah, you know, grab your safety footwear. Let's go and have a look, and, and then then you know together let's understand what we can do as opposed to automatically saying we can't do that. And I think we ended up putting the the pallet layer up one higher with a little bit of uh, technology such as counterbalance tables, you know, to to take out some of that lifting and straining of people. So, you know, I would say look for the solutions, don't look for the barriers, and engage in those conversations in an open mind. Excellent. Um, well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I mean, there's there's loads of questions and apologies to the ones that, that I couldn't ask. Uh, I mean, we, we could have literally had another hour on this. Um, so I'd, I'd like to formally thank uh, both yourself, Mike and Reese, on, on a very enlightening webinar today. And it, it, I think it, it was really enlightening. You know, I, I took a few a few uh, key points out of that. And I know I, I've been seeing the discussion in the chat and the q and I think a lot, lot of people on the webinar did. So but yeah, thank thank you for doing that. Um, I would just say, just oh, just very briefly, I would just say that sorry. the uh, uh, the webinar um, is being recorded and will be put onto the IOS channel um, in in about a week or so. Yeah, and if there's any further questions that people have for me, um, you can find find me on LinkedIn or you can email me, um, or just give me a call. That's, that's fine as well. Um, but yeah, if there's further questions, just reach out and uh, I'll. I'll do my best, to, my best to answer those. Old, old retro phone call, eh, Mike? Uh, yeah. Re yeah, I know. Believe it. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah, that yeah. still happens. Yeah. Um, well, well, thanks once again, and, and uh, thank, thank you to you both, and thanks for Monica for for um, introducing the session. It was really, really useful. Um, and thanks everybody Good. for the for the chat and the the interaction in the chat, the Q and A. Um, and, and that formally brings today's webinar to an end. So thank you. Uh, find us on uh, IOSH Logistics and Retail on LinkedIn. Give us, give us a, a connection on there. And if anybody's got any questions, um, drop us a message. Okay. Thank Thanks a lot. Right. Cheers. Thanks, Cheers. team. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.